All right, well, good morning, Anchor. Good to be with you all today. Uh, like Katie said, if we haven't met yet, my name is John. Uh, I am one of the pastors here at Anchor uh, for a little bit longer. Uh, and I just want to say, like, thank you so much to the kind and the generous responses that I got uh, when we talked about the fact that I'll be stepping off the Anchor team this summer as I change careers. We have a little bit of timeline stuff on that. Um, September 30th will be my last day on the team here at Anchor, so I'll be slowing down over the summer. I'll be preaching a couple more times here, once in August, uh, once in September, so I'll be around. Uh, I am so excited for what Pete Tegler is going to bring to this executive pastor of ministries job when he comes off of sabbatical and steps into it. I'm really excited about the steps that we've been taking to uh, fill Pete's worship pastor role. We'll share more about that soon with you all, Um, but we're excited, and I'm going to be here through the summer, uh, and so... Yeah, excited to be here, excited to be in our Genesis series. Uh, We're going to try to cover a lot of content today. Uh, In the Bible, we're going to be looking at about four different chapters uh, that cover the story we're talking through today. You do not want to have me say four chapters of the Bible out loud to you. I do not wish to read that out loud to you. Uh, So I would encourage you to, on your own time, read the stuff we don't discuss today. Um, Everything that we talk about today is going to be pulling from Genesis chapter 6 up through Genesis chapter 9, verse 19. In these four chapters, you will find the story of a man named Noah, his family, and the flood. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of the flood, whether it's from the Bible, a movie, a TV show, a Sunday school flannel board. Uh, But just as a primer reminder, uh, here's the cliff notes. The world got really, really bad. Uh, It says, God looked at the world and no one had any good left in their heart except for Noah. Noah had found favor with God. So God tells him to build a big old boat. Uh, We get the measurements in scripture and we get the fun unit of measurement called a cubit, uh, which is cool. Then God tells Noah to put two of every animal into the ark along with his family. Uh, It rains a ton. The earth floods, takes forever. Noah sends out a dove several times. Uh, Dove comes back. Eventually, the waters recede. God makes an agreement with Noah, saying he's never going to do that again. And there is a big rainbow uh, in the sky as a sign of that agreement. That's the story, right? Those are the cliff notes of these four chapters in Genesis. Now, up front, I do want to say there are so many fascinating details in this story. There are little tidbits that could each send us down a really, really, really long rabbit trail. And we just don't have time to do that today. Uh, Just because we don't cover something in full in teaching from this stage, though, doesn't mean that we think it's not worth studying. Right? Like, we want to reserve the time we have here on stage in this teaching setting uh, for discussing what we believe are the most important elements of the scripture passage for us today. But we're in Genesis, we're talking about the story of the flood. I know how I would be in the room. I know how some of you are in the room. You're like, we do have to just like name a couple of these things if you want me to focus on the rest of it. So here we go. Uh, Was there really a flood and did every single literal animal we have today fit into that ark? Probably yes, probably no. Um, (laughs) Right, like just real quick. Uh, Just like in Genesis 1, we have a creation account given by God to the people of God for the edification of the people of God that mirrors the styles of other creation accounts that other cultures have. And God said, hey, here's the true one from me. Many cultures at this time have a flood account. There's a lot of science that can speak into that. Do your own kind of digging on that. Uh, Spurgeon said this quote. He's an English pastor and theologian. He said, if Moses had meant to describe a partial deluge upon only a small part of the earth, he used very misleading language. But if he meant to teach was that the deluge was universal. He used the very word which we might have expected he would use. That's interesting. So we have secular accounts of a flood at the time, biblical accounts of a flood at the time, a word study that verifies the biblical account. Uh, It seems likely that there was a large, maybe global flooding event. But like every account that we have from people at this time was from one part of the world because all the people in the world were in one part of the world at that time. So was it an actual global event where the entire earth was flooded or just like this one part of the world that everyone thought was the entirety of the world flooded? I don't know. Um, It's a mystery. A mystery that while it's fun to explore, 
I don't believe is actually material to our understanding of the story in Scripture. Yeah. Right? Like, material is significant enough to change our view of what something says. I don't believe that that's material enough to change our understanding of the story in Scripture. Next, did every animal we have today fit into the ark? Probably not. Uh, like, lo logistically, lo what, what are we doing, right? Like, it doesn't work. Like, I'm a math person. The math isn't mathing, right? Like, I don't even know if every animal we have today even was around in Noah's time period. And there's a beauty in studying how God made his creation and I, I created, like, there's some really cool aspects of that. But I don't think every animal we have today was in the ark. Like, that doesn't make sense. It's a mystery, right? And a mystery that, while fun to explore, I don't believe is actually material to our understanding of the story in Scripture. Okay, next. Uh, we're just going to get ahead of this one. Was Noah really 600 plus years old? Probably not. Uh, scholars such as John H. Walton point out that in both biblical text and secular text of the time, ages could have served symbolic or literary purposes, reflecting the cultural context and theological messages of the time. Walton points out that numbers in the ancient Near East often had symbolic meanings as a title or as a show of authority, not as a literal age. This is true. If you look at uh, the Sumerian king list, which is a secular account of the time period, you'll see the same thing. Oftentimes, genealogies, like we find in the Old Testament, were designed to function as theological constructs, not historical records. Is it the most likely option that everyone just lived like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years back then? Probably not. But the flood story in Genesis and how it uses ages matches how the world talked about ages at the same time. So whether people actually lived that long or everyone just talked about age that long, again, I think is a mystery but not a material enough issue to change our understanding of Scripture. Does that make sense? So now that we've hit those rabbit trails, we're going to hit pretty heavily right on the bat, like what I think is the most important thing that we take from this story right off the bat, which is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. God grieves a broken world. God grieves a broken world. Genesis 6, starting in verse 5, says this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. If you're underlining stuff, I want you to underline that. Only evil all the time. We're going to come back to that. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is hard. This is a hard passage. I think one of the reasons why it's hard has to do with us and our story and less to do with the passage. I think it's really easy to look at this and go like, man, God was really angry. He took vengeance upon the world. He's an angry God who doesn't really love us but just wants to control us. And that narrative might make the most sense to you if you experienced that from an authority figure growing up. It's important to note that it says this, his heart was deeply troubled. His heart was deeply troubled. God is sad he is, he's deeply, deeply troubled because his creation is in complete darkness and he cannot abide that. I think one of the other reasons why this passage is so hard for us is we do not have a good understanding of that part that I told you to underline, right? Where it says, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. I am a cynical person. I am a glass half empty person. Sometimes it makes me a great pastor, sometimes it makes me a terrible pastor. Um, I like dark humor sometimes, right? Like in the office when Dwight is like, we need another plague. Or in, in the show Hawkeye when, when Clint Barnes drinks out of the like Thanos is right mug, right? Like I like that and I think it's funny. And the reason why I think it's funny is because I cannot fathom a world that is totally evil. Right, like that's why dark humor is funny because we've never encountered that reality. Like, we've never actually been in a world that is completely, completely evil. And, like, we have seen some awful things. Like, there have been genocides throughout history. We have treated image bearers of God in inexplicably horrific ways. And the world wasn't fully evil. 
like there was still humanity with basic good in it. Like we cannot fathom a world where every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And so I think oftentimes, like because we don't fathom that well, we start second guessing God. And we start second guessing, like God wasn't really only evil. And that's a problem with me and my understanding and not God and his actions. Because what I'm saying is, God, I don't trust your account of this. And that goes down a really dicey road, doesn't it? When we start thinking that we know better than God. And God, so what do we take from this? One, God will not abide his creation to live in utter darkness and evil and brokenness. Like he loves it too much. He loves it too much. The second is this, his heart was deeply troubled. Some of you are in a hard season right now. Maybe you had something to do with it. Probably you didn't. Regardless, I think it's important for you to know that God is deeply troubled on your behalf. And we see often in scripture when God is deeply troubled, he does take action. And even if you can't see God taking action in your circumstances right now, I want you to know he is deeply troubled and he is grieving and he is brokenhearted for you. That you are not alone in your brokenness, that the creator of the universe loves you and feels your brokenness as well. Okay? God grieves broken world. We're gonna, so the flood happens. We're, we're going to jump along. We're gonna, again, you can read this on your own time. We're going to jump all the way to chapter 8 now where it says this. God remembered Noah and the animals. Uh, the rain stopped falling. I'm skimming. It's on the screen. Uh, the water receded steadily. Uh, lots of numbers of days. 17th day, 7th month. End of, end of 150 days, right? And you can see when we start to throw these numbers around, you can see the argument for the symbolism of numbers, right? Like, the odds that it was exactly 150 days, or was that symbolic? Right, like, we, we see that. We see that, especially in verse 5, the waters continue to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Uh, so, verse 6, Noah opens a window he makes in the ark, so we're really sure it stopped raining, uh, sent out a raven, it kept flying back and forth until the water dried up, then he sent out a dove, the dove couldn't find anywhere, came back and forth, back and forth. And finally, the dove comes back and it has an olive leaf, which means like, hey, stuff's growing again, which is awesome. And no one knows that the water has receded from the earth. And again, like verse 13, like we see the symbolism stuff here. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. So what we see overarching in this passage in chapter 8 is this, is that there is hope for new creation. There is hope for new creation. There's some really cool symbolism in this passage when we talk about the dove. Uh, if you recall, you go back to the first teaching we did in this series in Genesis 1, chapter 2. It said that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters before creation. The dove is often used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, when Jesus was baptized, it says that the, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. Uh, in imagery, in, in literature, in art, the dove is used as a symbol of God's Spirit. And it's so cool to see that just as the Spirit hovered over the waters at the very beginning of creation, in this time of a new creation post-flood, we see a dove hovering over the waters again. It's such a cool illustration. It actually shows... In the process of this flood, God's heart for the hope of a new creation. Spurgeon said this, he said, there's something significant about Noah undergoing burial to all the old things so that he might come out in a new world. This is not dissimilar to what happens to us when we say yes to Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus and surrender our life to him, there are things that we used to do, a way of living we used to have that needs to be buried and put away. So that on the other side, we can come out into a new world of freedom. This is part of the symbolism that we have in, in, in baptisms, right? When we do baptisms, we, there's a symbolism of going down under the water, the old life going away and coming up as a new creation in Christ. That symbolism has roots in this flood story. There is hope in new creation. But, but as we see with Noah, becoming a new creation takes time. 40 days, then a raven, then a dove, then a dove again, then a dove again. And then after that, two months later, for the flood waters to fully recede. The flood happened, right? The old things, the old ways, they had been buried. And still it wasn't ready because becoming a new creation takes time. 
Some of you have turned over your whole lives to Jesus recently or a part of your life that you've been holding on to Jesus recently and you're wondering, why don't I feel brand new yet? You're saying, God, I said yes to you. I turned over the old ways. Why am I still drawn to the old ways? Why am I still drawn to the old things? Why don't I feel as new on the inside as I did in that first moment? God, are you not real anymore? These are the real questions that we ask when we turn our lives over to Jesus. You're saying, God, I've surrendered everything. Why am I not transformed yet? Becoming a new creation takes time. Trust that just like with Noah, if you've said yes to Jesus, if you've handed something to him, God is still doing a work. Time is needed. If you're feeling impatient, I get that. I'm right there with you. But even when you can't see the difference, right, I ask that you trust that God is still doing a work. Becoming a new creation takes time. What we see next in the story of Noah is so fascinating to me. You see this, we see that a fresh start isn't a fix for the brokenness of humanity. There is no utopian world or society that even God could create that would eliminate the brokenness of humanity. We've, man, we've failed at this so many times and we don't learn our lessons, right? Like, this is how cults happen, right? They're like, if we just create a world, if we just create a society, if we just do this where everything's in control and we can, we can make sure that no bad things happen, it doesn't work. I remember I, before I came here, I was a youth pastor for two years on Bainbridge Island, a community that I love dearly and a community that's been formed by a lot of adults moving there for their kids and saying, we're going to create like this little safe island where our kids are going to have amazing educations and great friends, and we're going to love them really, really well, and everything's going to be good and perfect. And that's not like explicitly said. It's sure implicitly said. But when you think that everything has to be okay, you start pretending that everything has to be okay, and then when brokenness comes in, you push it off to the side, and that just makes it worse. And there is so much hurt and brokenness and just insidious inside stuff that I've dealt with in the lives of families in that community because we don't deal with it out in the open. That new job isn't going to change your life. Like, you're still going to have a crappy boss somewhere. Like, you just are. (laughs) Right? You're going to be a bad employee there too. Like, you just are. Like, we're people. (laughs) Like, moving to a new school, a new city isn't going to change the dynamics in your family. Like, you can't run away from brokenness, create a new life in a new world and expect that it's not going to follow you. Right, like, I remember, man, I, I was so disorganized during the school year, and has anyone ever felt the optimism of a new planner? A new planner going into the school year? That new planner doesn't change how disorganized I was. I really wanted it to. Boy, it didn't. Right, like, new starts don't change our brokenness. The only solution for our brokenness is a relationship with God. Right? Like a fresh start doesn't change that. Sin happened in the Garden of Eden. The closest thing, probably the thing we've had that's actually been utopia ever in the history of this planet, and sin still happened. So what do we see? We see with God and Noah this, the new way forward. The new way forward. Uh, we get to see the first of what's going to be several covenants. Now, a covenant is a binding agreement between two parties, and it's really, really serious. Uh, We've lost the seriousness of covenants in our kind of nomenclature and vernacular today. When I went to a a Christian college, we had a covenant for life together. It was rules. Like, it was like, don't do this, don't do that. (laughs) That's not what a covenant is. Like, a covenant is so much more serious than that. It's a legally binding agreement between two parties. It's like life and death. And it's, it's really, really cool when we look at the theology of it. I'm trying not to steal from uh, Nor, who's going to preach in a few weeks, um, because we're going to go really deep into covenant theology there. So if you're like, John, this is really cool, we're going to get there. Yeah. Um, I just can't steal. Um, <laughs> so, but we see the first example of this in chapter 9. So in the beginning of chapter 9, right, at the end of chapter 8, Noah and his family made some animal sacrifices to God out of thankfulness, and, and, and that's a really cool thing that we'll come back to. But in chapter 9, it says this. We're going to skim again, but we're going to have it up on the screen. God bless Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful, increase in number. The fear and dread of you will fall on beasts of the earth, birds in the sky, all the creatures. They're given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the plants, I now give you everything. Pause there. 
There's stewardship in that, right? Right, this isn't like I give this to you to waste and to be wanton, reckless with. Just like in the beginning, when God gave us the greenery of his creation, he's saying there's, there's a responsibility here. This is a gift I'm asking you to steward. Don't eat meat that has lifeblood in it. For your lifeblood, I will demand an accounting. From each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by human shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. We're going to pause there again because this is really important. Every single person is an image bearer of God. No matter how much someone drives you nuts, no matter how much you detest them, how much you're grossed out by them, how much you hate them, no matter what they've done to you, they are an image bearer. And when we stop seeing people and we stop seeing ourselves in the image of God, that hurts God's heart. Everyone is an image bearer of God. Now, some of you need to remember that about like your neighbor. And some of you need to remember that about the person in the mirror because you have a really hard time looking at yourself and seeing you're made in the image of God, but you are. And we get to the covenant now. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, the animals, everything that came out of the ark with you. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the first agreement that humans really have with God in a long-term sense. Right? It sets up life moving forward. We need ground rules. We need a way to deal with what happens when we humans mess up those ground rules. Right before this, right, we talked about the first example of humans offering animal sacrifices to God as a way of either thankfulness or atonement that we have in the scripture. This covenant is so cool because it shows that God is promising what his role as creator will be in regards to his creation. And also sets up kind of the sacrificial system that we see moving forward in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about that more. And there's a distinction that's so important to note that this covenant makes, and we have to say it here, which is this. God doesn't stop taking sin seriously with this covenant, but the way he takes sin seriously changes, right? Like God doesn't stop taking sin seriously, but the way that he takes it seriously has changed. And that's significant. The rainbow is an interesting sign of the covenant, right? Like I remember as a middle schooler, I was like, I, man, I'm so sorry to English teachers in the room. Like, as a middle schooler and a high schooler, I was that punk kid that's like, maybe the curtains are blue because they're blue. Like, maybe there's no symbolism in there. Um, so I apologize. You guys were smarter than me. Um, I remember being like, maybe there was just a rainbow because it had just rained. Like, I don't know. But I think there's a really cool, cool aspect of it. It's such a unique shape. It's a unique symbol. There's a, a, an Old Testament professor named Bruce Walkey. Who, who talks about the significance of the shape of the rainbow as a sign of the covenant. Um, have you guys ever fired a bow and arrow? Bow and arrow? Okay. I haven't fired a real one. Like, if you're, like, a hunter in the room, that's not me. Like, my hand's down. Um, like, my sister helps at a camp, and they have little bow and arrows that my kids can use. Um, I fired that. <laughs> okay? Um, so, no, no street cred there. But um, it's so interesting, right, when you pull it and you not, right, it has this curve to it, right? The bow has this curve shape to it when you, when you load air, right? It bends. I don't, someone knows more about what those words are called. Um, but what's really cool, and this scholar points this out, is that the rainbow looks like this loaded bow. And at a time where we could see vengeance and justice coming down from heaven, like an arrow shooting down on earth in this flood, we actually see that it's pointed up at God. And it's this cool sign of this covenant and God saying, I'm never going to wipe out humanity. I'm not going to do this again. I take sin seriously, but I'm going to take that upon myself. The bow isn't pointed down at us in this vengeful, angry authority figure who's mad at us and punishing us. It's a God who says, I don't want you to live in brokenness and darkness and filth, and I'm going to take that punishment myself. I'm, going to, I, I'm not going to, the bow is pointed at God, not at us. I think that's such a cool aspect of that symbol. It's so important, though, to remember the privilege that we get being here in June of 2024 and knowing how the story ends, right? Like the first people who read Moses' account in Genesis had no idea what was going to happen. 
they had no idea that that rainbow was actually a sign of God saying, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear the responsibility. Jesus is going to come and, and, and die because of brokenness. We get to know how the story ends, and we get to know that there is a God who promises to make all things new. There's a God who promises to make all things new. In Revelation 21, verse 5, it says this, He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making everything new. And we cannot lose sight of that fact. We cannot lose sight of the fact that this flood account, this story, is such a great picture of God's heart for creation, his heart for us, his heart for me, and his heart for you, which is saying this, I will not allow you to live in brokenness and darkness because it is not good for you. I will not allow that. And I take this very seriously, but I'm going to take it upon myself. I'm going to take it upon myself. The quote from Spurgeon that I read earlier finishes this way. It says, Noah underwent burial to all the old things that he might come out into a new world. And even so, we die in Christ that we may live with him. We die in Christ so that we may live with him. As the band and the communion teams come forward, know this, we have to live in light of a God who promises to make all things new, including you and including me. That's what we get in this account of the flood. There's hope for new creation, that God grieves brokenness and he has hope for new creation. And not just this covenant system, not just this new way, but Jesus who's gonna come and make all this obsolete. Jesus who's gonna come and, 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 and that arrow pointed at heaven and Jesus takes for us. A God who believes in us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. That's what we remember with communion. A little bit, you have an opportunity to take communion to the front or the back of the room and it's available to anyone who said yes to Jesus, even if today is the very first time that you're saying yes to Jesus. I think this, there is such a clear picture here in the story of what God wants for us. If you're here in the room or you're hanging out online and you don't know, you haven't said yes to Jesus, I think you're here for a reason. I want to make it so clear, like there is an invitation from a God who loves you to bury the old way that you've been doing things and say yes to the freedom and the new way he offers. All you have to do is just acknowledge that today. All you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry. Sorry for the things I've done. I'm sorry for trying to live with my way. God, I want to say no to those old ways of living and yes to the way moving forward with you people who would love to pray with you about that today. I'm going to pray for us. And then as the band closes with this last song, I would encourage you, if you said yes to Jesus, to come take communion um, either at the front or at the back of the room. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the parts of your word where we get to see your heart so clearly. I thank you that you love us, that you love us so much that you won't allow us to live in darkness and filth and brokenness, God, and you provided a way to rescue us from that. So God, I pray that if there's anyone who's holding on to a last ounce of stubbornness of doing things their way, God, that you would nudge them, that you would press on their heart, that you would remind them that there's freedom and that your burden is light and easy. God, would they feel the freedom to say yes to you today? And God, I pray this, that we as a church will continue to point to you and your promises that you've been so faithful to us in God. Would we continue to point people to you? In your name, amen.